everyone. Welcome to the June 18th edition of the Time Form US Pacecast. I'm David Aragona, and I'll be joined in just a second by my co-host, Craig Milkowski. This week on the podcast, we're going to discuss the big night of racing from last Saturday at Churchill Downs, which featured the Grade 2 Stephen Foster Stakes. We'll also go into some racing from Belmont Park, where they ran the Grade 3 Poker on Sunday, as well as some stakes races from around the country, including the Pegasus Stakes, which featured the return of Maximum Security, the Kentucky Derby winner that took place at Monmouth Park, as well as some races from Santa Anita and Laurel. And then to wrap up the show, we'll discuss a new feature in the Timeform US Pace Projector that was just added this past week. Without ado, I'll welcome in my co-host, Craig Milkowski. A belated happy Father's Day to you. Uh, how was uh, the past weekend? I was good. Had a great time with my kids Sunday. Uh, took, took some time off from racing that day, but I did make sure to catch up on all the replays when I was doing the figures. And looks like I missed some pretty good action on Sunday. I did see all the racing on Saturday, so looking forward to talking about it. Yeah, it's funny. They piled a lot of the uh, nice stakes races onto Sunday this week, I guess, to take advantage of those Father's Day crowds. It was packed at Belmont Park. I was out there on Sunday for a little bit before uh, heading out to see some family later. And uh, yeah, really crowded day. Uh, great to see all the people come out, though, for Father's Day. Uh, we'll begin, though, on Saturday uh, with the night card at Churchill Downs. And uh, we'll take a look at the future race from that day, the Stephen Foster Won by Seeking the Soul in just a bit of a minor upset. Uh, the big favorite in this race was Giftbox, who was coming in off some really nice performances out in California. Came back on relatively short rest off his uh, second place finish in the Gold Cup. But a perfect trip sitting in behind the speed and was really the only horse that did a whole lot of passing in the stretch. Yeah, he was. He got a 127 time form U.S. speed figure, as did the runner-up Quip, who who was beaten just the next. So no surprise they had the same figure. Uh, not sure what to make a gift box here. Uh, it would be easy to say maybe it was just a little too short to him, but he did look a little flat to me. I think it was probably a little more than just the distance, but a solid race. Uh, I know earlier in the year after the Pegasus, you were kind of a on the seeking the soul bandwagon a little bit and he kind of backed up that opinion here he ran really well and i don't think there's any doubt he was the best horse uh we didn't have the pace coded as as fast or slow it was moderate i would say at best and he was still able to make up some good ground and pass a lot of horses so good effort by him yeah, I tried to keep the faith with seeking the soul a little bit uh he's a horse that as you said had run really well in the pegasus you know, you can't really hold the Dubai World Cup against him because some horses just don't show up on that card. And it seemed like his last race at Churchill behind McKinsey and Tom Staitov was just a little bit of a prep. Uh, and he showed up in this race. He's always been a good horse. He's always been capable of performances like this. And he just worked out the right trip sitting in behind the speeds this time. Uh, he was a little more keen than usual, racing up close to what, as you were saying, was a pretty moderate pace. Uh, it's not, None of the fractions are color-coded blue, but uh, you see kind of that rising pace figure line even among the leaders, uh, Tom Day Todd was even quickening towards the end of the race, and he was the front runner. So it was a race that seemed to work against the closers a little bit. I was actually pretty surprised to see the field as strung out as it was in the early going. Uh, a horse like Yoshida was uh, over 10 lengths behind the leaders in the early stages, and I just don't see how you could win the race from there because uh, we saw in the lane, the leaders just kind of drew away from the field as horses coming from the back of the pack had a really tough tr time trying to make up ground. Uh, Yoshida actually made a bit of a middle move to get into contention and just couldn't quite sustain it uh, but I think it was a tough race if you were trying to come from way back yeah it was I'm not sure what to make of Yoshida I'd be curious to see what the the plans are for him next if they go back on turf or if they try dirt again with him uh, probably a little more valuable if he's better on dirt he already does have that one big win on dirt so he's an interesting horse uh, I'm willing to put a line through this given the pace he, he did lose some ground if I remember right and he, he just didn't show up so I'd give him another shot see how he looks but but not much of an effort on Saturday night yeah and I think this race just sort of encapsula encapsulates the situation among the older horses uh, throughout the country where there's no clear division leader uh, you can't call seeking the soul a division leader by any stretch this was just a grade two race even though it did have a bit of a grade one feel to it with uh, the two favorites in the lineup Yoshida and gift box but uh, I think we're still waiting for a horse to put more than one big performance together and really back it up. Uh, you know, we saw McKenzie not really uh, run well in the Met Mile, but not really take the division uh, in any kind of dominant fashion. So uh, I think we're still waiting for that horse to come along. But there's plenty of time left in the year uh, for these horses to assert themselves. Uh, moving on to the Philly and Mares. 
early in the earlier in the night and the Fleur de Lis, uh, we saw Elate finally get back to the winner's circle. I know she's a horse that a lot of people liked off her performances last year when she put on that great duel with Abel Tasman and the personal ensign. Hadn't been quite so brilliant in her first few starts of 2019, but uh, she got the job done here, I think really appreciating the slight stretch out in distance. Yeah, and I think you phrase it perfectly when you say got the job done, because I was really hoping as a fan of the horse that, you know, she would have popped a big figure, but it wasn't the case. She ran a 119, uh, slightly better than what she'd been running to Oakland. I think she had run in the one teens a couple of times uh, before that race. But, you know, it was workmanlike. She got the re- that got the win. She beat Blue Prize, who's a, a solid enough mare, and she's a Julie who, who had been running really well. I think maybe this is just a little bit far for her. But uh, just, you know, it was a decent effort. Uh, Hopefully there's more improvement to come. I I imagine she's going to show up at Delaware for the uh, Delaware Handicap next time, a race she won last year, and and the 10 furlongs should be right up her her alley. Yeah, this is another race where I think the pace slightly affected uh, the final time. They didn't go slow up front per se, but it was not a quick pace by any means. They were just kind of you know, walking along. And Elate was the horse that was really finishing off the race at the end. And I think she deserves credit for running down the two horses that were up front at the quarter pole and had the jump on her. Uh, Because like we saw in the Stephen Foster, uh, you know, the horses that were towards the lead really did have the advantage and Elate did run well to, to, to get them at the end. Uh, She's supposed to be running a little faster than this, I guess, if we're going to be talking about her as a potential uh, challenger to Midnight Bisu down the line. I don't know if she's really that good. I don't know if she's ever going to get back to that personal Ensign effort from last year. But this was at least a step in the right direction. And it sounds like they're going to try the Delaware Handicap, which uh, the 10 furlongs is what she wants to do. So uh, there are limited opportunities for these fillies and mares to do that. But uh, she'll take advantage of that spot. And uh, you just have to hope she takes another step forward in her subsequent starts. Yeah, and I was a little surprised. I actually searched. I knew the Delaware Handicap was at 10 furlongs, but I was looking for other uh, grade ones at the distance for for fillies and mares, and they, they just don't exist anymore. So the Del Cap's about it, and, and if she really wants to win the division, she's she's going to have to run faster at this nine furlong distance as we move into fall where all the big races are really run. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and based on the performance that Midnight Bisu put forth last week in the Ogden Phipps, uh, Elate's going to have some improving to do to, to best her over nine furlongs, I would think. Uh, one of the most competitive races that we saw at Churchill Downs on Saturday night was the Wise Dan, which ended in a blanket finish, uh, March to the Arch, just barely getting up over a huge long shot and all right with the favorite admission office closing for third. Uh, I thought the ride that T- Tyler Gaffleone gave the winner really made the difference in this race because he just did everything right. Uh, I did as well. This was actually the one race I cashed all, all night, I think, if I remember right. And uh, it, it was a good one because I, I wouldn't say he was really maybe not the best horse in here. Uh, it was a blanket finish, uh, but it was just a perfect ride. It, somehow he got over to the rail from the outside post with a short run to the the first turn. He used his horse just enough to save ground. And then he got out at just the right time uh, and was able to use his finishing kick to get up to win. And and as you say, I mean, the ride really did make the difference. Uh, from a speed pay figure point of view, the race was a bit of an eyesore for a grade two. Uh, the top two finishers ran 117s, the next three all 116s. And normally that kind of bunching is indicative of a weak race for the class. And I think that's what we got here. Uh, it was a good betting race, but I don't think I'm going to be putting any of these in my stable mail as horses I want to want to bet next time out. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. March to the Arch took advantage of the situation and ran a nice race for him. He definitely appreciated the class relief that he was getting uh, as compared to the grade one performance or race that he ran in his prior start behind uh, Bricks and Mortar. He was never going to win that race. Uh, this is probably where he belongs. But when you see horses like 71 to one all right finishing second and 33 to one parlor finishing a very close third, uh, rather fourth, and he was actually in position to win the race at about the 16th pole before flattening out, uh, you do kind of question the quality of the field i know it's got the grade two label felt like more like a grade three race and i think the speed figure kind of confirms that assessment yeah when i made the speed figure i kind of look you know the regret which we'll talk about was run a couple races later and you know i was kind of judging how how to make the speed figure and i could have changed this race because it was the only one running a mile but even in that case it would only been maybe two points faster so I, i just didn't see any real evidence to do that and I'm just going to go with the clock told me and the 117 and just a mediocre grade two. 
Yeah, one other thing. I saw some criticism of the ride that Joel Rosario gave admission office. I didn't see anything really wrong with it. Maybe the horse was just a little bit too far back, and it was a race that I don't think you wanted to be coming from so far behind because some horses that were relatively close to the pace did fine, like the runner-up, who was a long shot. Uh, it just seemed like admission office ran out of real estate at the end because he was really finishing well, and he got out with, a, with some time left. He just couldn't really get there. No, and I mean, it's a 12-horse field going a mile on the turf. Everybody can't get a perfect trip. Uh, you know, like we said, in this case, Tyler Gaffleone gave a, gave a good effort. He saved ground and probably was the difference. But, you know, sometimes it's just circumstances. It's not necessarily a bad ride. I mean, you can't just bull your way wherever you want to go. And when you draw the 12 post, you're kind of at the uh, the mercy of the rest of the field and what you're, how your horse breaks. Yeah, I feel the same way. I was actually a little perplexed that he was such a short price in that race admission office because it seemed like a really wide open race on paper. Uh, I believe the second highest speed figure of the weekend uh, after the winning number that we saw seeking the soul get and the Stephen Foster wa- went to Mr. Money uh, when he won the Matt win. Watching this race, he just looked like a winner all the way around the racetrack, just seemed in complete control, drew off with authority. Was it the toughest field ever? Certainly not. But this horse just seems to be in great form right now. He does. This was probably the most impressive race of the weekend for me. Uh, he looked like a horse who, who was going to win every step of the way. I actually bet Nick's go in here hoping he could rebound a little bit and finally get a clear lead. And he actually did, but it, it just didn't matter. He wasn't good enough. And Mr. Money really looks like a horse that's turned a corner. This was actually the fastest uh, two-turn race by a three-year-old this year. Uh, it is at only a mile on the 16th, but if somebody wanted to argue with me that, that he's taken, you know, right to the top of the division, I couldn't really give a whole lot of argument against it other than the fact that it's a little shorter and I'd want to see it at a little longer distance. But he just looks like a horse that, that hit that three-year-old, you know, sometimes these three-year-olds jump up and find a new level, and he seems to be one that's done it to me. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm not sure what to make of him in terms of where he fits in the grand scheme of things with the the top three year olds out there, because while he's running some really fast races, uh, the big races in the division are at a mile and a quarter and a mile and an eighth or turning back to seven furlongs. And I wonder if he's a horse that belongs in the Travers or if he's a horse that belongs in a race like the grade one Alan Jerkins. Uh, I'm just based on the one turn race that he ran the Pat Day Mile. I would kind of lean towards the latter route and say turn him back to seven furlongs because I'm not sure he's a horse that really wants to go the mile and a quarter. Uh, But I think his connections have a tough decision to make there because he does have that natural speed, but he also can win going two turns. So there are some options. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. And that's what I was saying about the distance. I'm not sure a mile and an eighth would be out of his scope. You know, maybe a race like the Haskell and the there are some others, the Jim Dandy, but if the, the I almost called it the King's Bishop, I'm glad you said Earl, here are the Jerkins. If the uh, the Jerkins, it, it seems like it's a race that would, that would hit him right between the eyes. I don't think he'd have any problem with the turn back, would surely get plenty of pace uh, to be able to come from a little further back. So, you know, he's just, he's the kind of horse you want in your barn. Uh, they have a lot of options with him. Yeah, I totally agree with you, though. In terms of just natural raw ability, he's arguably one of the top ones out there right now. He's definitely a horse to keep an eye on moving towards those big races. Uh, The final stakes race from Saturday at Churchill Downs was uh, back to the turf for the three-year-old Phillies in the regret. Uh, A race that I think the pace had a lot to do with because you see a couple blue color coded uh, pace figures and the top two just went one, two around the racetrack trading positions and hard legacy. She was game to win. She held off a challenge from the runner up in the stretch, but uh, you could see kind of how the race was going to unfold by the time they got to the quarter pole. Yeah, definitely. When you see run horses run one, two in a turf race like that, you can be pretty sure the pace had something to do with it. Almost always. Uh, congrats to trainer Norm Cass. I think it was his first graded stakes win. I saw his uh, his wife was on the broadcast and jumping up and down, I, I, you know, reasonably so, of course. Uh, but, you know, just a, a decent effort. She got a 109 time form U.S. speed figure. It's not near some of the ones we've seen recently from uh horses whose names escaping me that beat newspaper a record we've had a couple of them lately but concrete you know, rose. Was, yeah concrete rose and, and the other one from chad brown's barn who also beat her uh I but anyway it, yeah yeah it puts you know she she's a solid enough graded stakes horse uh but not one i'd really think is going to move forward and be a real leader in the division yeah i feel the same way about that it was a grade three race and that's kind of what it felt like 
Uh, hard legacy. I do think she benefited from the more aggressive tactics because if you watch her prior races, they had been, they kept trying to take her off the pace and she was getting way too headstrong. And I think Julian Leperu, I don't know if he was riding to instructions or if it was his decision, just made the right call to just drop his hands and let her run on. Uh, she didn't break uh, on the lead, but the, he allowed her to run up into that position, moving around the clubhouse turn. And she just seemed to really settle when she got out in front. And certain horses just need to be out racing on a clear lead uh, to run their best races, no matter how fast they're going. And she just seemed like that kind of horse. And that was the, really the key to success with her. Uh, when her sunset she continues to run well she took another step forward on the speed figure scale here uh i just don't know if she's really a grade one or grade two type filly i know she's got that regal pedigree being out of winter memories but uh it seems like races like this might be her ceiling right now yeah and if there's one horse i'd want out of here it's probably the third finisher varenka who just given the pace didn't really have much chance but i just don't know if she's good enough she's never run all that particularly fast and maybe this is just her level where if she catches the right field in a grade three and gets some pace she could win but you know i don't know she's not running well enough that i think she's one that could step up off this trip and beat better fillies i was a little bitter because i need i needed varenka to complete uh, the blade pick four this night but uh, she she did have a little bit of a trip. Uh, she, the pace worked against her for sure. Uh, while she didn't have a ton of serious trouble, I, I thought Javier Castellano had to alter course at a critical juncture right at the top of the stretch when he wanted to be quickening with her. Was she going to win the race? Probably not. But maybe she could have run up into second with a clear run. Uh, but like we were saying, not the toughest three-year-old Philly stakes out there. So these horses are just OK right now. Moving on to Belmont Park. Uh, the grade three poker was run on the Father's Day card on Sunday, and this race featured a wild finish, uh, just a real blanket finish, five horses across the finish line. Uh, Gucci Factor got the win. Uh, he's a horse that's really developed a knack for winning races lately, a New York bred who's just continued to step forward, moved through all of his allowance conditions, won a New York bred stakes last time, and just seems to be doing really well for uh, Christophe Clement right now. Obviously, this race uh, was marred a little bit by the unfortunate incident with Clyde's image right at the end of the race. Uh, reportedly, his career, racing career is over after he bowed a tendon. Uh, he probably would have won this race. But uh, it was an exciting race to watch uh, right to the finish with you know, five horses across the, the, the wire like that. Yeah, it was. Uh, the winner got a 122, and, and down in fifth, uh, Clyde Zimmons got a 120, even though I just said he pulled up in the last few strides. And I'm with you. I don't I don't think there's there's little doubt he was probably going to win the race. But, you know, tightly group finish. Uh, the, the one takeaway I get from here, and it's just, oh, I see it over and over, is for somebody uh, of my age to see how well these New York breads can compete when they step into open company. I mean, when I was first getting into racing back in the 80s and 90s, that, that almost never happened. I mean, it was a rare thing. But these days, it, it just isn't that big of a jump. The purses are so good for these New York breads. The breeding has really improved that, that you can almost, uh, you know, just ignore they're coming out of state bred races and look at the speed figures they've been running and see if they're competitive of which Gucci factor certainly was. And I'd imagine it's a pretty cool win for Christophe Clement to get a graded stakes done with this horse because he is, I would guess he's the best son of Gio Ponti that we've seen. I, I don't know if Gio Ponti has really turned out to be one of the top sires. He's had a few good horses, but uh, nice to see Christophe Clement train uh, son of Gio Ponti for the same connections, uh, same ownership and everything. Uh, so this horse, he's just doing really well right now. He's always been a nice horse. They toyed around with running him on dirt a little bit when he was younger, I believe when he was a three-year-old, and he actually ran really well on that surface too. But it seems like now that they've really keyed in on running him on the turf consistently, he's just continued to develop. And uh, we'll see what's next. I mean, 122 is a decent speed figure for the level. Uh, he closed into a pace that wasn't slow, but it certainly didn't necessarily set up for closers by any means. So uh, he just, he's just a nice horse, and maybe he can take another step forward. He is, and I just want to mention Christoph Kalmana. He is such a good turf trainer, especially at this mild distance and the, the extended turf sprints we get at six furlongs and seven furlongs at Belmont. I think you just always got to take note of his, his horses in here. They just seem to run well almost every time. Now, the future race on Saturday at Belmont Park was not of the highest quality, not certainly not compared to the poker that we just talked about. Uh, again, won by New York bred, since this was a New York bred stakes race for the Phillies and Mares in the Dance and Renee going six furlongs. Uh, this race featured the two half siblings, a holiday disguise and midnight disguise. Holiday disguise is more of the sprinter type, and she just seemed 
to be the one that wanted to go this six furlong trip, whereas her sister just really ran out of real estate and finishing third. As for the others, they're not really stakes quality horses and Holiday Disguise didn't even need to run her A race to beat them. No, she didn't. I, I'll admit I did have a little trouble with the speed figure for this race. I was really tempted to break it out from the others. It, it came back so slow. But, you know, other than that, there just wasn't a whole lot of evidence that anything happened with the track other than this race came back a little slower than I expected. So I stuck with it. Uh, if you want to say maybe they ran five points faster, uh, you know, I could live with that. I could have went either way with it. But but I like to have some reason to do it. And it just couldn't come up with one here. Um, not a very fast race at all. Only a 105 for the winner, 103 for the runner up. But the runner up was also kind of my, uh, you know, one of the deciding factors. She's just not a particularly fast horse. She was 12 to one in here. And she basically ran what she's been running all along. So you know, it's a race. If you want to upgrade it a little as a handicapper, I would understand that. But but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Yeah, I really can't argue either way on this one, because Holiday Disguise, while she's had a nice career and she's won a number of New York Red Stakes races, she's probably not in the best form of her career right now. We saw her win that New York Red Stakes over the winter at Aqueduct that also came back unusually slow. I believe she only got a 106 for that race. So while she's run some faster time, faster speed figures against graded stakes company when she stepped up to try those horses, when she has to win these races against New York Reds, she just doesn't run the fastest numbers. So I think it makes sense to go on the lower side for this one. Uh, as you were saying, JC shooting star, the runner up. She's a really nice New York Red. She shows up on dirt and turf and she's really honest, but she's not, you know, the, the fastest horse out there. So I, I pretty much agree with this. Nice race from the winner. Nice to see the sisters run one three, but uh, I don't think we'll be seeing these horses winning against graded stakes goes anytime soon. A couple of races to discuss from Friday and Sunday that were uh, non-stakes events. We saw some two-year-olds in action on Friday's card. Uh, only a four-horse field, but a pretty fast final time. Kind of an oddly run race where they went very slow early and fast late in this five-furlong two-year-old maiden. And Chris Engelhart's uh, first-time starter took charge was the winner. Yeah, it's the reason I pointed this race out. Anytime you get two-year-olds running a, a figure north of 100 and it, both the top two got 101s uh that that's usually a little bit of an eye opener for me two-year-olds this year this time of year usually don't come out that quick and particularly when you mention the pace it, it was really slow in here uh it's probably what got three technique who who was the the favored horse by the public i'm, I'm sure he had most of the buzz coming in at four to five, but he, he just wasn't able to run down his uh, father's chart. Chris Englehart was a winner. Jeremiah Englehart trained the runner up, but I just think these are two couple two year olds to watch. Uh, they they ran fast. They didn't necessarily run fast early, but they really finished. And, and I would imagine we're going to see both of them at Saratoga. Yeah, for a four horse field, I thought this was actually a pretty interesting race to analyze because took charge ran really well. I mean, a 101 time form to a speed figure for a debuting two year old is a nice number. Uh, but he did have that pace in his favor where a couple of horses didn't break and it just sort of allowed him to control the pace up front and really sprint home that final quarter mile, which is really the only part of the race where they did a whole lot of running. Uh, three Technique, who took all that money, as you were mentioning, for Jeremiah Englehart. Uh, ran well to close from last. I mean, it was just last in a four-horse field, so it's not like he was making up a ton of ground. But uh, it seems like both of these horses have some ability. Uh, actually, in my Horses to Watch segment that I'm doing this week where I analyze some trips, I want to take a look at the third-place finisher, Yankee Empire, because he's the one that had a bit of a trip and was really negatively affected by the slow pace. So that's an interesting one to watch back. But I think all three of these horses might be decent two-year-olds and ones to follow moving on to Saratoga. Just a fast race. And just to briefly mention the pedigree on the winner, uh, even though we didn't take a whole lot of money in this spot and Chris Engelhart's not really known for sending out live two-year-olds, this one's got some really nice sprint pedigree on the dam side. He's actually from the family of Indian Blessing and Axeman. Uh, the dam's a half-sister to that, to, to Shameful, who's the dam of those horses. So uh, he's bred to be a nice sprinter. So this one could have a future. We'll see. Yeah, that's certainly some speed in that pedigree. Yeah, definitely. Those are nice horses. Uh, on Sunday at Belmont Park, uh, the non-stakes event that got the biggest speed figure was the allowance race, which I believe won as the seventh on the card, uh, won by Timber Ghost. I've got to be honest, never been a big fan of this horse. I know he takes money a lot and he typically runs some decent speed figures. I didn't think he really wanted to go the mile on a 16th, but he got the distance here. Uh, knowing the horses that he was beating, I don't think it was the toughest field, but look, I've been wrong about this horse on more than one occasion and he just keeps stepping up his game. 
Yeah, I mean, he just runs pretty fast all the time. Not exactly stakes level horse, but just kind of caught my eye because he kind of backed up the a race we had talked about previously where preservationists and expert had run one, two, and kind of really pulled clear of him back in third. I believe he was a distant third in that race. So more more so not pointing out him, just that those two are probably horses to watch when they come back because I think that was really a legit race that the preservationists ran and expert ran well that day also. Yeah, this race did get a lot easier, this race on, on Sunday at Belmont, when Expert was actually entered to run in this race, and he scratched out, I believe it was a vet scratch on the morning of the race. So that gave Timber Ghost a bit of an advantage, and also the fact that the, the favorite in this race, Backside of the Moon, just didn't show up at all. He's kind of an inconsistent horse, and he did not show up with one of his better efforts on this occasion. So that sort of left the race for uh, Timber Ghost to win, uh, given the competition that was left in here. But a 118 is a decent number. Uh, he's a horse that can win from on the lead or just stalking the pace. So I believe at this point he's almost out of allowance condition. So they pretty much have to try a stakes after this. And we'll see how he stacks up against those tougher horses in the future. Moving on to some other venues. I think the race that most people are were talking about at the end of this past weekend uh, was the grade three Pegasus from Monmouth Park. Maximum Security made his return. Uh, the horse that I believe I called him the Kentucky Derby winner earlier in the show. No, 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 no. He's not no. actually the Kentucky Derby winner. He's the horse that was disqualified out of, out of the Kentucky Derby win. Uh, he uh, made his return in here. I know Jason Service was going back and forth over whether to even run in this race early in the week based on how he was doing. Uh, he had that stumble at the start. Uh, I know that's an excuse that his connections pointed to as to why he lost. Personally, I believe the pace had something to do with it as well. And the fact that the winner king for a day just seems to be doing really well right now. What was your take on this race? Yeah, I agree. I, I thought one to nine was just ridiculous on maximum security. I know we've talked about, I think we even mentioned last week that neither, you know, some people are proclaiming him the, the easy leader of the division. And I just wasn't buying that at all. I, I think we both agree. He had a fairly easy trip in the Derby once he established the lead. And, uh, you know, based on our speed figures, King for a day was right there with him. He had run a 118 uh, back on Preakness weekend, uh, whereas, you know, maximum security got a 120 winning the Derby. So that the odds discrepancy just seemed a little ridiculous to me. Now, as far as the um, the figures go for this day, King for a day got a 120, maximum security got a 119. And I don't put a whole lot of credence into that stumble. I don't think it cost him anything. He was able to regroup quickly. He was able to get to the lead and set the paces he wanted. So I, I can't chalk that up as a reason he was beat. I think King for a day was just a better horse on this day. Yeah, it sounds like both horses came out of the race in good condition. So I don't think the stumble, I don't think there was any physical issue that stemmed from that. Uh, what I saw watching the race was just maximum security was off the bridle before a lot of the other horses. Uh, he's a horse that I know that the first quarter of the Derby was very fast, but after that he got to back down the pace to a considerable extent. And uh, we, you know, we even had those blue color coded freight pace uh, figures in the middle of the Kentucky Derby. So, and even in the Florida Derby, he set a pretty slow pace. So he's not a horse that had really had to withstand a strong pace challenge in the middle of a race or in the second half of a race. And King for a day really served that up this time. He was with maximum security when he made his move into the far turn, went with him right to the quarter pole. And maximum security just couldn't quite sustain that bid that as he tried to get away from King for a day. And like you were saying, King for a day might just be really getting good right now. Uh, his speed figure coming off this in the, or in his prior start in the Sir Barton uh, suggested he, would move, he was moving in the right direction. He's a horse that had shown some real talent as a two-year-old, even though he had had some pickups in his campaign and uh, it was a little interrupted. But uh, I don't see any reason why he can't be in the upper echelon of this three-year-old division right now off this performance. Both of these horses ran fast races, and I think Maxim Security was just second best on the day. Yeah, and I agree with you. This, this horse did really show talent as a two-year-old. And they, that race that, that I mentioned at Pimlico was his first race off about a six-month layoff. So to, to run an 118 off the bench like that showed you that, that Todd Pletcher really figured out what was going on with this horse and had him back in top form. And, and he just looked really good to me. Uh, I wasn't sure he was going to run him down there in the stretch when, when I was watching. But, you know, he actually, once he... He just kind of grinded him down and, and went right on past. And, you know, I'm curious to see if he'll go in the Haskell or if they're going to point him to the Jim Dandy. But I wouldn't mind seeing a rematch in here. And I'd be tempted to go with uh, King for a day again. I agree with that. Uh, he was just in the bridle throughout. Joe Bravo didn't even really have to ask him. He was going easily, whereas Luis Saez was really pumping on maximum security around the far turn. 
I liked everything I saw from King for a day in this race. And I just hope all these three-year-olds stay sound at this point because it's really shaping up to be a fun second half of the year. We'll see them split off in the Haskell and the Jim Dandy, some of them. But uh, if all these horses make it to the Travers, I could see a full field and a really competitive race uh, for that uh, Midsummer Derby in August. So that's what I'm really looking forward to, just following as we get there and handicapping when it actually comes time for it. Yeah, and the one thing I want to say, too, is, is you know, the crops get knocked a lot. They're slow and this and that. But it's not a big leap for some of these horses to step up a few lengths and be right there with the older horses. It's not like they're dealing with uh, – gun runners and arrogates this year uh, we haven't had a whole lot of horses i don't think we've had a horse yet that's in training run a 130 on the dirt maybe mckinsey you know going long going around two turns maybe mckinsey t- hit 130 uh but you know it's not a big jump and and three-year-olds can and will still keep improving throughout the year so i'm not ready to write these horses off towards as we get to saratoga and we get to later races where they start having to take on their elders that's actually a really good point, and I, I wanted to make a similar point. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, the the Derby, the Preakness, the Belmont, they weren't, from a st- historical sense, they weren't that slow. And I feel like because this is such a competitive three-year-old crop, people are mistaking this for just a really poor three-year-old crop. And I think it's a little premature to say that because there are a lot of horses that can run speed figures in this 120 range. And I think that's a great thing. Sure, we don't have horses running the kind of speed figures that Justify ran through his Triple Crown season last year, but we rarely get those. So I think it's a fun crop of horses that are all not exceptionally fast, but they're fast enough to make it fun in these grade one races. Yeah, I agree. And even a race like we have the Ohio Derby coming up this weekend, and it it drew some really good horses. I think uh, Long Range Toddies in there, Owendale, and Global Campaign. Uh, it's only a field of seven, but just a matchup of those three should be a really fun race. They, they've all run fast races already, so uh, that's just one I'm looking forward to, and we're going to see a lot of that this fall, this yeah, summer yeah. and fall. Definitely agree with that. Looking forward to all of these races. Uh, moving on to the final two venues that we're going to discuss this week. Uh, I guess we'll go to Laurel next before we discuss some Santa Anita races. They had a nice day of stakes races at Laurel. Uh, watched a few of them. I saw that Please Flatter Me came back and and won after she had finished second to Kofethi in her prior start, earning a respectable speed figure. But we're going to discuss the Prince George's County Stakes, uh, which was won by Dr. Mountie. I believe this race earned by far the highest time formula speed figure of all the races that they ran at Laurel last weekend. Uh, Dr. Mountie got the best of Divisidero. Uh, what did you make of this race watching it? I thought Divisidero got there and just sort of hung on the money and left it open for a horse to close him down at the end. He did, and Dr. Mountie's just the kind of horse to do that. Uh, that's a perfect distance for him. He seems to love a mile and a mile and a 16th. Uh, the pace was slow. We had the opening half mile, quarter mile, and half mile coated in blue. And uh, really, I didn't give DeVisadero any excuses. Uh, he was six to five. He, he should have been able to win, and he wasn't able to do it. But he did lose to a horse that's a, a multiple graded stakes winner, albeit I think they're both group grade threes that he's won. But a solid effort, a 120. I mean, it compares okay with the race, the uh, poker stakes that we saw at uh, Belmont Park. So solid field of horses for Laurel, which is why I highlighted this race. I'm glad you did bring up Please Flatter Me as she did come out of that Kofefe race and and was able to run basically the same figure and, and winning this time out. So not that we needed to legitimize Kofefe's race, but but this one certainly did that if you had to do so. Yeah, Divisi Darrow is a funny horse because just watching him throughout his career, it seems like he wins races when he's able to make that last move and his riders can perfectly time it and just get his nose in front right before the wire. But when he makes the lead too soon or when he's in contention right at the quarter pole, it just seems like he doesn't finish off his races with the same energy. And that's what happened here. And it, it left it open to it for a horse to close him down at the end. And Dr. Mountie is a horse that has been running well while never really winning races. Uh, He's always running well at the ends of his races. He was closing well into a slow pace in the Appleton a few races back. Uh, He ran actually deceptively well in the Makers 46 mile against the tough field. Didn't handle the soft turf course in the Fort Marcy last time, but he's been in pretty good form and just steadily improving. I thought Forrest Boyce gave him a great ride to make that last move this time and get up and... 120 is a respectable number. I don't think this race had a grade on it, but he is a grade three type of horse. And uh, just Shug McGahee, typical uh, scenario with him, just getting these older horses to keep improving with age. Yeah, it was. And I, I think anytime you see Shug McGahee shipped a place like Laurel, you better take note. 
Yeah, definitely. He's got a great record there. Uh, moving on to Santa Anita, we threw a few stakes races there from this past weekend. On Saturday, we saw some California breads in action in the Thor's Echo, uh, going six furlongs on the dirt. And uh, this race was looked a little bit competitive on paper, but on the racetrack, it was anything but that, as Desert Law just completely dominated. I mean, he looked like a winner coming around the far turn, and he really delivered in the stretch, just running away from this field with ease. Yeah, he did. He, he got a 117 time for him, U.S. speed figure, and it was actually a 122 final time that we knocked down kind of because he was tracking a slow pace. Uh, we had all the fractions highlighted in blue. Uh, but even the the 117 was 10 points higher than the runner-up, Coil Me Home, in second. So he was really a dominant winner, and, and that 117, that, that could win some open stakes out in California. It's it's not going to beat a horse like Roy H. if he ever comes back or grade one types, but it could win some of the smaller sprint stakes out there if he moved into open company. Yeah, I've got to be honest, I'm not that familiar with the California breads that are running in these races, but just looking at Desert Law's past performances, this was his second race off a layoff. He had actually run a pretty big speed figure in his final start of 2018, and it seemed like that that getting that race under his belt last time really aided him, and he was able to get back to that level in this spot. Nobody else really showed up behind him, and he just uh, ran away from this field pretty easily. Definitely looks like a horse that's in career form right now and on his way to bigger and better things. Uh, we saw the three-year-olds in action at Santa Anita on, I believe, Sunday in the Affirmed. Uh, this was a race where Bob Baffert had a very strong hand coming in. I believe he entered three of the runners in this race. Uh, Roadster was leading his charge, the Santa Anita Derby winner, come making his first start since the Kentucky Derby. But Roadster was a little dull on this occasion as his less heralded stablemate, Mucho Gusto, got the win. Mucho Gusto is just a really honest horse who runs at a variety of distances. And if the top three-year-olds aren't going to show up, he's right there to take advantage of it. You know, he is. He's a horse who hasn't really impressed me much, but he finally did impress me a little bit. Uh, I think with Roadster, we saw that San Anita Derby. He just really benefited for, from the trip he had that day. And I just don't think he's a real top quality horse. Uh, Mucho Gusto is a horse on the pace projector. We had picked the beat Roadster based largely on the fact we thought it would be a slow pace and that Mucho Gusto would be on the lead. We did get a, a moderate pace. It, it's not enough to be coated in blue, but it's certainly you can see the ascending figure pattern in our charts. But what I liked about Mucho Gusto is he didn't have to be right on the lead, which he had shown that ability before. Uh, winning a race at Santa Anita. And I was really impressed how he rated kindly and, and was able to pass horses and really pulled away. I'd like to use the pace as, a, as an excuse for Roadster, but Roadster was right there with Mucho Gusto, just a, a couple lengths behind him, and he just got out finished pretty easily. So, you know, the 115, that, that's not going to win any, any grade one races for three year olds this time of year, but he's a solid enough horse who, who if you put him in the right spots, is going to win a lot of races. Yeah, watching this race, Mucho Gusto just looked to be in control throughout. He was moving easier than the leaders coming around the far turn, and he really had developed quite an advantage on Roadster by the time they got to the quarter pole. I, I really agree with your assessment of Roadster. I, I've never really understood the hype around this horse or why people have been considering him as one of the top three-year-olds out there. Uh, there was a time when people were saying he should be the Kentucky Derby favorite. Uh, in retrospect, that Santa Anita Derby – the lower figure that you gave it, I, I think that's turned out to be right because we haven't seen too many horses come back and run very well out of that race. I know Game Winner had that wide trip in the Kentucky Derby, but even he disappointed a little bit in that race. So uh, we're still waiting for horses to run well uh, from that uh, from that Derby prep. And Roadster just he ran a 112 here. That's among the best numbers that he's run. He just wasn't quite as good at his, as his stablemate, Mucho Gusto. And like you were saying, I I haven't been that impressed by Mucho Gusto either, but I do admire his versatility. He can win from on the lead, off the pace. He can go seven furlongs. He can go a mile and a sixteenth. A mile and an eighth is probably pushing it a little bit, but we've seen him try it in the past and do okay. And he's just an honest horse who will win these grade three or grade two type of races. Yeah, and I imagine he he's bred by Mucho Macho Man. Uh, he's probably uh, bred to get better as he gets a little older. So, you know, I'm not, not writing him off as a horse who can't win a grade one down the line. With some improvement, he certainly could. And I think he's one to watch because his versatility is certainly an asset. The final race that we'll discuss on the podcast this week, which will serve as a good segue into our last topic of discussion, uh, was the Possibly Perfect from earlier on the card on Sunday at Santa Anita. 
not the toughest group of uh, Phillies and Mares on the turf, but I was somewhat impressed by the winner, Lamuna, because she overcame an unfavorable pace situation to just mow this field down in the stretch. I mean, you could see when they came off the far turn and she swung out widest of all at the quarter pole. She was really in high gear. Frank Miramati picked it up in his race cool call, and she just uh, really finished with a lot of energy. Uh, she's a horse that's tried a variety of surfaces in the past, but it seems like she's really coming into her own as a turf horse. Yeah, it does. Our, her form was a little hidden. She had run on dirt last time, didn't run particularly well. But her turf race before that, she had run a 109 and an impressive performance. Um, you know, like you said, the the first three fractions through six furlongs were all co coated in blue by us. The the pace was really slow when you look at it numerically. It, it was they were finishing way faster than than they set out early. Uh, so good effort by Lamuna, a typical California turf race, uh, as you'll see, often dominated by Richard Baltus and Phil D'Amato. Uh, those two are really worth noting in all of these races. They always send out runners that, that are ready to roll. And, you know, Lamuna just, just was able to overcome that pace. Uh, I'm not sure the pace setters were all that great, which is something we'll talk about in just a second, but it was still quite a finish by her. Yeah, I think this race actually, it's a great segue into what we're going to talk about next, because uh, this was a race just looking through the entire field. There were no confirmed front runners in the group, and the horses that were on the lead, they were sort of in those positions, uh, not based on any rider intention. They were just there sort of by default, because there was nobody else to take up those positions. And sometimes those horses don't always respond so well to being on the lead. And often races like this, even though they feature relatively slow paces, they're just won by the horse that has the best leg kick, and that proved to be Lamuna on this occasion. And I think that's why we made the decision to make a change to the time form U.S. pace projector, and I'll let you talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, we came up with this no speed label, and we're using it for races where none of the horses have a running style of speed or leader or even tracker. And the reason is, I mean, I pretty much look at every race every day almost on our past performances. There's very few I miss. And I just saw so many times in races like this where, where the horses that, you know, we project to make the lead, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. That's one part of it. It's very tough to predict who is going to lead in here. But even when you get it right, the horses just don't seem to finish. Uh, it is a little bit of an advantage. Just uh, I didn't just do this uh, haphazardly. I actually went back and studied a, a whole bunch of races that would have had this label in the past and decided that it's just the way to go. We don't want to be telling people that, that the race favors horses on or near the early lead when, in fact, they really don't because uh, you see a lot of horses like this that we see in here who don't really want to be on the lead and just kind of get stuck there, as you said, by default and don't particularly run well, and it's almost a bad trip for them. Kind of, It's a bit of a stretch, but like you mentioned with the Visadero, if he makes a lead too early, he doesn't run his best. He really needs to get the last run, and almost similar where you just don't want horses making the lead too soon if that's not what they're accustomed to. Yeah, just looking at this race we were talking about and the possibly perfect, uh, the horse that was on the lead in this race, Pulpit Rider, uh, she was a, I mean, she's a mid-pack runner in time form U.S. past performances. That's what her running style is listed as. Looking through her races, she's really a mid-pack sort of closing type. So who knows how a horse like that is going to react to suddenly being the pace setter or being on the lead in a race or contesting the pace. Sometimes it's just not how they want to run. And the horses that are behind them actually have an advantage because they might have superior finishing speed to begin with. And they're getting more of the covered up trip that they really want. So it's not a race that would necessarily favor horses on under the lead. And I think having a third distinction really does make a lot of sense in these situations. Uh, also, I think it just uh, kind of says that this is a pace projector we probably don't have a ton of confidence in uh, because there is no horses with front runners, speed, leader, running styles, uh, the early pace ratings. And we often see these types, sorts of pace characterizations with no speed in longer turf races or longer dirt races. Uh, or, and uh, often in those situations, uh, there are horses that uh, just don't have front runner or leader running styles. And uh, they would not be the kinds of horses that have an advantage in those sorts of races. So we just can't have a lot of uh, confidence in those pace projectors. 
Right. And the one tip I would give is when we make these running styles and our pace projector, we're generally looking at the horse's last five races. And what I've been doing personally is I actually go back and look further in the PPs. As you know, in our past performances, the, it's really easy to see the lifetime PP to just scroll through. And I'll look back at those horses we show on the lead and see if maybe somewhere in the past they've shown the ability to to win or run well from on the front or near it. And if not, I'm just not going to bet them. Uh, so, there have been a few cases where I have seen horses that have, have it, well, you know, might be eight, nine races back where they showed they could run on the lead. And, and then I may give that horse a little more credit and a little uh, a further look. When you see the no speed pace, uh, f- pace projector characterization in past performances, is there anything that you would look for as a horse that might be able to benefit from that situation? Or are we trying to suggest that that's not something that we should really be instructing handicappers to look for? Uh, does the late pace rating matter more in this situation? Or is it just the kind of race where you want to look for the best horse and not really uh, care that much about what the pace is trying to tell us? Uh, I, two things. I look for the, the best horse. And then I do look for horses who have overcome slope. I say overcome who have come from behind in slow pace races before, because it is very rare. You're going to get a fast pace in a race like this. It's almost always going to be at best moderate to slow. So I want to see horses who were still able to finish and run down their rivals, despite the pace being slow when, when everyone else is finished. And it tells me they, they have a really strong finishing kick. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really good advice because uh, you want horses that can uh, adapt to a situation that they've encountered before. So check out the time form US uh, past performances and see what you make of the no speed uh, pace projector label. I think it's a really helpful tool uh, to help get an idea of how races are going to shape up uh, in these longer turf races and marathon dirt races. I think it really uh, can aid some handicappers uh, as we uh, try to analyze these races moving forward. So, Craig, thanks for talking about these races this week. We'll have another batch of races to recap next week on the Timeform US Pacecast. As always, you can listen to us on DRF.com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or SoundCloud. Just subscribe to the Daily Racing Form, and the Timeform US Pacecast is part of that channel. So thanks for listening, everybody, this week, and we'll talk to you again next week.